Okay, so right, now we're getting into the meat of this. So, uh, when glutamate diffuses across the synaptic cleft, what's going to happen is that four glutamate molecules are going to bind to this AMPA receptor, and two glutamate molecules are going to bind to the two non-glun-1 subunits of um, the NMDA receptor. So, both of these uh, receptors are going to open. And I should also mention that in some portions of the brain, rather than having the AMPA receptor, you instead have the kinate receptor here. Okay, but the kinate receptor is pretty much very similar to the AMPA receptor. It's got four subunits, all of which bind glutamate. Okay, and it conducts monovalent cations. Okay, so what happens next? Well, this... Um, this AMPA receptor is going to open and it's going to allow basically a positive current into the cell because um, the electrical potential difference across this membrane is usually minus 65 millivolts. So before we're assuming that this uh, membrane is at its resting membrane potential of minus 65 millivolts. Okay, so if we look at this graph down here, when the electrical potential difference is minus 65 millivolts, which will be somewhere down here, AMPA receptors conduct a negative current from intracellular to extracellular, which we know means that positive charge is going to net come through this receptor, into uh, this channel, into the cell, basically. So more sodium is going to come in than potassium goes out, so you're going to bring a net positive current into the cell. Okay, so that's going to produce your depolarization of the electrical potential across this cell, which we'll analyze in a moment. Now, is this NMDA receptor going to conduct any charge? Well, what's going to happen? It's going to open in response to the glutamate, but what's going to happen? This electrical potential difference is at minus 65 millivolts, so basically a magnesium ion is basically going to come straight into this pore and block it. So the NMDA receptor does not get a much of a chance to conduct any cations into the cell because magnesium blocks it too quickly. Okay, so usually NMDA does not actually contribute to the movement of positive charge into the cell, into the cell basically, because of the synapse here. So let's now, let's now think, in fact, we'll go over onto the other page. Let's think about what's, what's going to happen to the electrical potential difference across our postsynaptic cell. So let's just draw our postsynaptic cell out here. So here's our postsynaptic uh, dendritic spine on a dendrite. Okay, and basically we know that this AMPA receptor has now opened and is conducting a positive charge into the cell. The NMDA receptor has also opened, but it's blocked, basically. So there's some magnesium ion sitting in there, ruining its fun, basically. So it's conducting absolutely nothing. Uh, but the AMPA receptor is conducting a positive charge into the cell. Okay, right, so let's think about what the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is going to do. So initially, it was at minus 65 millivolts. If we block, plot the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular, then initially what happened was that the electrical potential difference was at minus 65 millivolts. Now, when you expose this cell to glutamate, that's going to open up these AMPA receptors, and they are going to conduct positive charge into the cell. So that means the electrical potential difference of the, well, the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment is going to get more, is going to go increase because you're putting in positive charge and you're also taking positive charge out of the extracellular uh, compartment. So the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment is going to reduce. Now remember what the voltage from extracellular to intracellular means. It means find me the electrical potential on the intracellular component and subtract off the electrical potential in the extracellular component, i.e. it means if a little man was to move from the extracellular compartment into the intracellular compartment, what would be the difference between his, um, between his second measurement of the intracellular compartment's electrical potential uh, and his first measurement of the extracellular compartment's uh, electrical potential? And basically, if this one's getting bigger, more pot bigger, and this one's getting smaller, then this value is going to become more positive. So basically, that causes a depolarization of the electrical potential. Okay, now, does it get necessarily get to negative 40 millivolts 
To trigger an action potential on this dendritic spine, you have to get up to threshold potential. But basically, this might not actually call, get high enough to, for electrical for um, the action potential to actually be triggered. Instead, might, what might happen is that it just sort of goes back down again. So basically, what's going to happen is that the glutamate signal is going to be dropped. Glutamate is going to go down. It's going to come off of these receptors. The receptors are going to close again. And if the electrical, if the you know, if the diff, if the amount by which it ro raised, um, the amount by which it raised the um, electrical potential difference isn't big enough to account for to activate the voltage-gated sodium channels, then you're not going to get an action potential. Basically, now this concept here that you just depolarized the membrane for a little while, uh, but then it went back to resting membrane potential. That's called an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So basically you did depolarize the membrane but you didn't depolarize it enough uh, for um, for an action potential to be fired. Postsynaptic potential. Okay. And basically what will what will as soon as you turn off these currents coming into the cell, then your then the normal uh, resting membrane apparatus of the cell will just restore your electrical potential back to negative 65 millivolts basically. Okay, so excitatory postsynaptic potential, or it's often abbreviated as EPSP. Right, okay, so now let's get on to the topic of long-term potentiation. The topic of long-term potentiation is that, let's say you have many synapses. So let's say we have many synapses now all synapsing onto uh, this uh, single dendritic spine. So here are a whole bunch of axon terminals which are going to synapse onto this single dendritic spine. So here's this same dendritic spine that we've always been working with, but now we've got absolutely loads of different axon terminals all synapsing onto it. Now let's say all of these axon terminals fire together. So all of them are sending down action potentials, and that's useless, you're not going to be able to see that. Um, so all of them are sending out action potentials, like so. And basically what this is going to lead to is that absolutely loads of glutamate being released into this, um, into this synaptic cleft. Okay, right. So what's now going to happen is that you're going to get this axon, uh, well this dendritic spine is going to be stimulated by loads of different axon terminals. And basically it's going to open absolutely loads of AMPA receptors. So absolutely loads of these AMPA receptors. I'll just draw in pink because the picture is too small. But absolutely loads of these AMPA receptors here are going to open, and they're all going to allow positive current into the cell. Now, if loads of them open, then it makes it more likely that uh, the amount of positive charge they bring into the cell is actually going to go over threshold potential. So this time, what's going to happen is that the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane which was originally at minus 65 millivolts. So again, we're looking at the electrical potential difference across the membrane of this uh, dendritic spine. It was originally at minus 65 millivolts. Now, it might depolarize actually up to the threshold potential. Now, basically, if it depolarizes up to the threshold potential, then that will open the voltage-gated sodium channel. So here is the voltage-gated sodium channels here, uh, which I'll show in green, just because that's the color I always draw voltage-gated sodium channels they open and they're going to allow sodium into the cell and basically that will trigger the upstroke of the action potential and then you're away basically you've got an action potential okay now basically what is observed this is the phenomenon of long-term potentiation what is observed is that if you do that if loads of axons uh, all stimulate this dendritic spine and they actually stimulate an action potential in this dendritic spine. Then, if you go back to the original experiment now, and you just hit, now that you just stimulate this single axon terminal here, and you, it synapses again onto this dendritic spine. So this is the same experiment, it's just this time we're not, uh, it's the same setup rather, we've taken the same, we're using the same axon terminals and the same dendritic spine, it's just we're not stimulating these axon terminals now. Basically, if we trigger an action potential in this, in this axon terminal here, that will cause the release of glutamate, 
And basically, if we measure the excitatory, excitatory postsynaptic potential, the EPSP, uh, that, that this dendritic spine will feel, what, and if we plot it compared to this original one, what you will see is something like this. The excitatory postsynaptic potential generated by this single uh, axon terminal when it's stimulated is now going to be bigger than it was originally. So basically, that's the phenomenon of long-term potentiation. Let me say it again. If you stimulate a neuron here um, at this axon terminal, and that then um, releases glutamate onto some dendritic spine, that causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential. If you stimulate this axon terminal and it uh, releases glutamate onto this dendritic spine and the dendritic spine actually fires an action potential, then the next time you just fire this axon terminal, the size of the excitatory postsynaptic potential induced by uh, this neuron, this axon terminal releasing glutamate onto this dendritic spine will be bigger. So basically this synapse has been strengthened because in the previous scenario, uh, when we, in the previous scenario, when you released glutamate from this synapse, from this axon terminal, it actually caused an action potential. So the action potential, um, the coupling of the release of this uh, axon terminal releasing glutamate and the, and the actual generation of action potential here causes, um, causes the strengthening of the synapse. And that is the phenomenon of long-term potentiation, that you strengthen synapses um, by uh, having the axon terminal, the presynaptic cell, releasing glutamate onto the postsynaptic cell and then the postsynaptic cell actually firing an action potential. If the presynaptic cell releases glutamate and it goes to the postsynaptic cell and then doesn't cause an action potential, then you don't get long-term potentiation. If it just causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential that doesn't get up to above threshold potential and therefore doesn't cause a fr an action potential, you don't get strengthening of the synapse, i.e. when you repeat the experiment again, the excitatory postsynaptic potential it will induce is the same. But, I'll say it again because it's worth repeating, this is such an important concept. If this uh, axon terminal releases glutamate and uh, which arrives at this dendritic spine and when it releases glutamate the dendritic spine happens to undergo an action potential um, as well and as I showed you here it might not be because of that axon terminal that it actually induced an action potential it was because you know it had these two helping it that it actually induced an action potential but when you just then stimulate this one again this synapse has been strengthened because of the coupling of the um, of the release of glutamate to the action potential. It's now been strengthened so that um, the um, the um, excitatory postsynaptic potential that this one can produce in the dendritic spine is greater. Okay, and this has a um, this has a uh, a sort of catchphrase that people often quote when they're talking about long-term potentiation, which is that neurons which fire together wire together. Neurons which fire together, wire together. And it's quite, it's, you know, it's quite tongue-in-cheek, but it is a nice, it does capture the, uh, the essence of long-term potentiation. Neurons which fire together, wire together. Okay, right. So, um, in the next video, what we'll do is we'll um, explore what actually is happening in long-term potentiation.